Okay, so I'm Lee Taylor from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. I've written a tool called Shroud to uh, create Fortran interfaces for uh, C++ libraries. So I'm going to go over the, uh, the motivation for creating the tool and our development environment at Livermore, some of the history and uh, requirements of Fortran interoperability with C, and then go into sh how Shroud works. So it creates several layers of wrappers, some examples of those layers, how uh, arrays are handled, since that's very important in high performance computing, uh, memory management, and then there's a lot of C++ features that are also dealt with. So I was originally uh, looking uh, for a synonym for, uh, for wrapping, and I came up with shroud. And I kind of like the second definition where it says cover or envelop so as to conceal from view. So the idea is shroud will generate these wrappers, and you don't have to worry about the details behind them. They'll just work. And I didn't really mean the first definition, because that might imply that the library you're wrapping is dead. So uh, the uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory is run by the United States Department of Energy, is founded in 1952, and they've been a leader in uh, high performance computing since the very beginning. So our current machine, uh, our biggest machine now is number three on the top 500 since it just dropped last month. Um, and so Fortran has a very long history at Livermore. One of the original staff members uh, worked with John Backus on writing the original uh, Fortran compiler. And a lot of the Fortran codes we have are like 30 or 40 years old and are still developed and are still used. However, C++ is now the uh, predominant language at uh, Livermore. And so there's not really any official decision you know, to change. Uh, people have just voted with their feet. Uh, no Fortran codes are being rewritten, but new development is going to C++. And so a lot of those C++ is in libraries, and those libraries need to be used by Fortran. So we started a computer science toolkit in C++ back in 2015 that we call Axum, and it was designed to share a lot of common computer science uh, things that production codes need, such as data stores and meshing and logging. And one of the requirements was to create a, a Fortran API for that. And so uh, I wrote this tool to help automate that, uh, to help all the C++ developers in the library. And it's since then been used by several other uh, libraries around the laboratory. So Fortran has, has increased its ability for uh, C operability. It's, uh, it's standardized. It used to be very much a do-it-yourself thing. So we, uh, we had our own version of Fortran at Livermore called LRL-TRAN. It's the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory Fortran. That was an early name for the laboratory. But it did not actually have any C interoperability because C didn't exist at that point. But one of the features of LRL-TRAN was it introduced integer pointers. They're also known as Cray pointers. So you would have a pointer statement that had a pointer and a pointee. And the, uh, the pointer, it was just essentially an address or a void star, and then it could be dereferenced by using the, uh, the pointee. So that allowed you to give dynamic memory to Fortran. So this, the pointer statement in this form was never standardized, but it is in pretty much every compiler available. And uh, we had a summer student at Livermore put it into G Fortran many years ago. So, and Fortran 90 did introduce allocatable and pointer attributes uh, to deal with dynamic memory. But instead of just using a raw address, they use a, uh, a metadata, a uh, dope vector that has a type kind rank as well as the uh, shape information. So you, uh, you couldn't pass those directly to C. Instead, uh, if your function did not have an interface, it would then pass the address of the uh, variable instead of the address of the pointer. So you could still use your uh, memory from C, but you could not allocate your memory in C. So Fortran 2003 introduced the interoperability with C features, and it addressed the main do-it-yourself features that people had to deal with before. So it added the value attribute to deal with the call by reference, call by value difference in uh, between Fortran and C. It introduced the bind C, which dealt with all the name angling, whether or not your uh, 
Fortran compiler added an underscore or not, or made name was uppercase, and added the ISO C bindings module so that your types in C could match types in Fortran. And this really helped with things like uh, ints and longs, which aren't necessarily standardized uh, as whether they're the same size or they're different. So in 2012, the uh, technical specification 29.113 was introduced, the further interoperability with C. It kind of gave compiler writers a head start on what was coming down. And so it allowed allocatable and pointer attributes to be used with bind C. So you could pass this C descriptor down to C. And it included this ISO Fortran bindings header so that your C function could then extract the metadata itself. And then in Fortran 2018, that was officially uh, rolled into the standard. But the problem is you have to code with the compiler you have and not the compiler you want. So Fortran 2003 is pretty widely available at this point. Um, G Fortran 4.3 uh, started adding some bind C features uh, over 10 years ago. And PGI still lists itself as a Fortran 2003 compiler on their web page. And the TS29113 is available in the most recent compilers. It's pretty widely uh, implemented. It went into G, uh, G Fortran 9.1 about a year ago. But at this, in the same change log, they also said that they were adding asynchronous I.O. from the 2003 standard. So this isn't really to pick on G Fortran, is because uh, I use G Fortran and I like G Fortran. But it does point out the difficulty from the standard to the uh, uh, compiler is, is sometimes a long path. So Red Hat Enterprise 7 provides GCC 4.8 as its standard. And you can actually, you know, install the later versions of, of the compilers. Uh, but like at Livermore, we just have GCC 8.1. And so when I asked them about installing later versions, uh, they said, well, that's kind of tied up with the Red Hat Enterprise 8 release uh, spring of next year. Uh, so this is not really tied to a Fortran specific issue. Uh, so the Axum Toolkit just recently decided we could use C++11 as a minimum. We had a very large production machine that did not have C++11, and we had to wait till it retired until we could move up to that as the, uh, the minimum. And Python 2 is still around, uh, even though it's end of life. So uh, I would like to use the TS29113, the further interoperability to see in the wrappers. It would simplify a lot of things and give more functionality. However, though, uh, it depends on the Fortran 2003 as the minimum standard. So Shroud generates some source files that uh, to wrap the C++ library. And so who would want to use this thing? So uh, one of the target audiences are C++ developers, and their manager comes in and tells them they need to write a Fortran API. And the response is, yes, I've heard of Fortran. That's the language in all uppercase. And they certainly are not familiar with modern Fortran. Or there's some Fortran developer who sees this new cool C++ library they want to use. And the first thing they find out is bind C that isn't working like they think it should. Or any developer who actually knows all the details but knows that there's a lot of boilerplate involved. So it will create, uh, simplify the creation of the wrappers uh, by creating a user who just creates an input file and then it creates the wrappers for you. Uh, it uses a Fortran standards to implement all of the wrapping. So there's not any do-it-yourself, which is very important because we expect these wrappers to compile for the next 20 years. And so it preserves the object-oriented style of C++ classes, and it creates a very idiomatic Fortran API. So uh, it does, uh, it can do conversion from blank fill to null terminated strings. So the person using the Fortran API doesn't really know that they're calling C++ underneath. So I've wrapped a lot of the uh, C++ features uh, that are there, the type types and classes and structs. And so there, it's, it does quite a few things. Uh, what Shroud is not, it is not C++ calls Fortran. That's kind of a different task. But it will create a C API for a C++ library. And that's useful since uh, Fortran has, only has a bind C. It does not have a bind C++. It does not parse header files. 
That's a very big job of parsing C++. Uh, but it does parse the declarations in the, in the input YAML file. So you can cut and paste, but it doesn't read in just your header files. But that's, you could, that allows you to start small and just wrap the functions that you care about. It doesn't cover 100% of every C++ feature. There's a lot of things you can do with templates. Uh, a little more, we have uh, this Raja library for uh, processing uh, GPU instructions. It does a lot of stuff with Lambda and, uh, functions that I don't think you can wrap. Uh, somebody asked if you could wrap gtest from Google as a, a Fortran unit testing, and you might be able to. I, I, I'm not sure what's exactly required, but we've uh, focused a lot more on high-performance computing sort of applications. Uh, does it scale real well? So I don't know if you could write wrappers for QT or GTK, which have you know 10,000 functions, since you're manually creating an input file. But you could maybe write a tool that would create the YAML file. It's not complete at this point. It, it does have a lot of functions, but it's missing inheritance. And I also remembered it's forgetting now. Uh, it's not doing exceptions and complex numbers fell through the cracks. And it'd be nice to have smart pointers as well. So the user, uh, the developer, the code developer, starts off by writing this YAML file. The little dashed line indicates that uh, you're cutting and pasting out of your library header files. You uh, run it through Shroud. You get a set of uh, C++ files and Fortran files that you then feed into the compiler and load them into your library. So it uses YAML as the input. It's yet another markup language. It's just a list of uh, dictionaries and lists. It's basically a superset of JSON. And it uses white space for indention to, uh, and scope. So the user can cut and paste from the, uh, the header files. So hopefully there's not quite as much typing as you might need. And then it provides a place to uh, give options and format strings to control the generated code. So how you name files and how you uh, name functions. So YAML sells itself as a human readable format and it works for me. So this is a sample of a YAML file. It's really, uh, YAML is just a keyword dictionary. So library is the keyword, pointers is the value. Uh, that's the name of the uh, the library that we're wrapping here. So options is a dictionary that contains another dictionary. And then declarations is a uh, dictionary entry that has a list of declarations. And so these are just cut and pasted out of the uh, header files. So ideally, you would just kind of set up how you want to write things. And then there's a lot of cutting and pasting afterward. So in order to, to wrap a, uh, the library so that it gives you a, a, a uh, idiomatic API, you have to tell the semantics of the arguments. So you can add attributes to the uh, function arguments and the function results. And so the intent attribute is essentially Fortran's intent attribute, but it's use, also used by Shroud to generate some copy in or copy out code. Uh, there's hidden attributes which are not part of the API. So when you're passing an array, the array knows how long it is, so you don't have to tell it, although you have to tell the C function how long it is. And implied attributes are, are kind of the same uh, way. So uh, the dimension attributes, when you have a pointer, you can tell it that the dimensions of that, so now it becomes an array instead of a pointer to a scalar or an output variable. Uh, for input arguments, you can tell the rank, and then it becomes an assumed shape argument. And the owner, because uh, memory management is very important, whether the library is responsible or the caller is responsible to uh, release the memory. And how you want to dereference your pointer. So by default, it'll use a Fortran 90 pointer. It can do an allocatable in some cases that's helpful. And so it will allocate new Fortran memory and copy into it. Or perhaps you just want the type C pointer back. So there's actually several places, uh, layers of wrappers that uh, Shroud will create. So the highest level is the Fortran subprogram that has executable code. That gives you a place to extract metadata from arrays and stuff, such. The uh, interface level uh, is essentially a uh, C++ prototype, and it should be pretty much zero cost, and it always exists. And then the C wrapper, 
it's uh, compiled with the C++ compiler, but it presents a C API, so I call it the C wrapper. Uh, and it, it, uh, in addition to wrapping your, uh, the uh, library function, Shroud can create some bufferify functions uh, where bufferify is defined as converting an argument into a buffer. So it will include metadata about that argument. And then you always call the user's library. So the simplest case is just a, a yeah, interface only wrapper. Uh, so here we're calling C, so uh, that simplifies things a little bit. The, uh, it's just a couple of arguments. And so it generates an interface that is essentially exactly what the user would have to write themselves. So it deals with the name mangling, with the bind C, uh, the call by reference, call by value with the value attribute, and the type matching by uh, C int. So it's using just all Fortran 2003 interfaces uh, features and just the interface. So when you call C++, uh, you have to create a, uh, a external that the Fortran can call. So in this case, uh, if you just change that to a C++ library, now the Fortran interface is gonna call a uh, lib under worker, where lib is defined by that C prefix in the example YAML file. So in this case, the all it does is it creates a function that just calls a C++. And what it's really doing is dealing with the name mangling. So Fortran or you know, C++ mangles names because you can have the same name, function name, in multiple contexts, such as in different classes or function overloads. And the Fortran compiler does the same thing when you have the uh, same function in multiple uh, modules. And so this also has a side effect if you have a C API that users can call directly because uh, it's compiled with the C++ compiler, but they're all extern C functions. And you also, you will need this wrapper if what's the function you're wrapping is not really a function. Instead, it's a macro or just a function pointer. So you have to go into the C++ to uh, dereference it. So sometimes just the interface block is not enough. So in this example, there's a const care star string coming in. Uh, since it's const, we know that it's intent n. And so uh, what the Fortran wrapper will do is uh, it'll uh, convert it from blank filled into a, a null terminated string. And then the interface then is just a, a care star, basically. And so when you use this function, you don't have to null terminate things yourself. There is a copy involved but it's kind of the exact same copy you would do if you were null terminating it yourself. So uh, if you, uh, the, the bufferify function, this is an example of, of uh, what that would do. So if you had a standard string argument, uh, it's gonna, you pass in a buffer, a, a care star that you wanna fill in, and so the bufferify function then passes down an additional argument, which is the length of that string using the Fortran intrinsic. And so then the C++ wrapper or the C wrapper now has an extra argument that says, okay, this is how long the buffer is. So the wrapper will then creates the, uh, the standard string, this library function presumably fills it. And then this helper function then copies that into the user's buffer in the Fortran and then the, uh, C++ library then cleans up standard string with its destructor. So this is emulating what most well, you know, what most compilers do now. They pass hidden arguments for the length of strings, uh, and we've relied on that a lot for do-it-yourself wrapping. There is some portability issues with the hidden arguments because the type of those lengths can change, uh, the, either len or uh, not lin int or a size t. So GCC Fortran, uh, G Fortran changed it to a size t in GCC 8. This makes the uh, length explicit. So arrays are a very fundamental part of Fortran and they're very important to high performance computing. So there's a lot of effort spent in how do you convert a pointer uh, to an array and references, C++ references are kind of dealt with the same way. So you must tell Shroud the shape of the array using an attribute. So either the rank in, so it's coming from the user, or uh, the dimension attributes where it's coming from the C++ library. So for example, you can give it just explicit shapes 
Uh, in this case, n items is another argument to the function that you want to use for the shape of the array. Or uh, return string in this example is just some other library in the uh, some other function in the C++ library you're wrapping that knows how long that string is. So there's a shroud array drive type that has all the metadata. Uh, and it's essentially the same thing as the uh, CFI C descriptor T. And eventually, I think there should be an option to, to use that. And one of the big differences is row major and column major. So it has to invert the uh, shape of the array. And so Fortran, I mean, is often thought of as a domain specific language for dealing with arrays. And it's kind of makes it kind of a niche language, but it's kind of the niche that uh, Lawrence Livermore is in. So this is an example of how you would convert the uh, pointer into an array. And so you add this attribute here, plus dimension in array, where in array is another argument coming back from the uh, library. So it's an intent out, so it's gonna fill in this scalar, and it's hidden from the uh, Fortran API. So you don't have to pass that argument to the Fortran API array, since Fortran arrays know their own size. And so the example of using this is you would declare a pointer, and I guess that should be an array right there. And uh, you get uh, the shape. If you really want to know the size, you can ask the array itself and fill it in. Whereas when you call it from C++, you have to provide another argument that says this is how long the array is. And so it's, it's exactly what a Fortran programmer would expect. So this is the, uh, the Fortran wrapper. It, it, declares, this is the same YAML input, it declares the shroud array variable that then gets passed down to the bufferified function as another argument, and then a CF pointer from the uh, 2003 standard is used to put that into a uh, Fortran pointer and then give them back to the user. So from the C side, uh, this is what the inside of that uh, shroud array looks like. And so it, it creates, fills in the metadata. The, the shape information is coming from the uh, attribute. So it's uh, dereferencing that argument. And then the, sh the size is just the, uh, multiplying all the shapes together. And then it also includes this capsule information at the top. So it has the pointer again and has the index into how to deallocate the memory. That's the index of the destructor. And so this shroud array is essentially the, the CFI C descriptor. So memory management is done using that capsule. Uh, you can't, when you pass the uh, memory back from C++, you're passing it inside another uh, class that also has some metadata, in this case, the index of how to release the memory. So it's just adding another layer of indirection. And you, uh, the problem is you cannot use the allocate to allocate that pointer because the memory was allocated by uh, C++. And so you often have to go through a uh, destructor as well. So the, the C uh, wrapper gives you a very simple, the capsule is very straightforward. Uh, and then it creates a uh, drive type. It puts inside a drive type with some uh, type bound procedures so that you can delete the memory yourself or the final clause will clean up for you when you're done with that, if, uh, if you're responsible for uh, deallocating the uh, memory. And so this uh, capsule is essentially uh, inspired by the Pi capsule from the uh, Python C API. So it just has an address, uh, destructor function, and some uh, metadata. So if uh, in this case, we're doing this function, but now we're saying that the caller is responsible to uh, delete that memory. So he owns it, so he has to get rid of it. So uh, you have the pointer, you have a capsule argument that is now an extra argument to the, uh, to the C++ function. You use your data as you like, and then you can delete it explicitly or let the final clause take care of it. So this is a very idiomatic interface. You don't see type C pointers floating around, although you can if you want to. Uh, and then it cleans up after itself. So this allows the C++ pointer to be uh, released in Fortran. 
So C++ classes uh, create a shadow class that uh, contains that same capsule. So as a YAML file, you just declare it a class and then you tell it the uh, declarations inside of it. Here's the, uh, uh, the constructor and a method. And so it just creates a tight bound procedure. And so from the Fortran, you can call it uh, as you would expect uh, as a uh, tight bound procedure. And that's very similar to the way you'd call it from C. So in C++, classes and structs are essentially the same thing. They just change uh, how you view the members from uh, either public or private. And so what Shroud treats a struct more as a C struct. And so it creates a drive type with a bind C. So if you have a struct with an XYZ in it, you can have an array of you know, 10,000 of them and it'll all be contiguous memory. So when you're calling a C++ method, the uh, Fortran wrapper then has to extract out that capsule it passes it through the interface into the C wrapper that then pulls out the address of the uh, C++ object, casts it correctly, and then uses C++ to call it. So C++ deals with the V table. Um, so overloaded functions uh, can uh, create uh, generic functions. So when uh, these functions will both have the same name. This is an example of being the, uh, the, fun uh, uh, the uh, how to name functions. So by default, it would give just a sequence name. So now you can tell it how you want to name it. So you can call a specific function or the uh, generic function. And default arguments are kind of dealt with the same way. Uh, templates have to be instantiated before they can be used. Uh, you can either have uh, class templates also, which create another uh, class type and uh, it creates a generic function in this first case. So you can call it with the, uh, by the single name and I'll call the correct function. So one of the big issues with wrapped code is it doesn't always do exactly what you want or something's wrong, you can't edit it. So I borrowed an idea from another wrapping tool that creates these splicer codes uh, that delineated by these comments. And so you can change what exactly goes in there if you don't like what the compiler made. So you can put those in the YAML file or an additional file. So it allows you to update the generated wrappers. So Shroud gives you interface to uh, the Fortran interface to C++ libraries. It creates idiomatic APIs, so you don't know you're calling C++. Uh, portable source, uh, it creates usually readable code. So if you change it in one place, then uh, it's potentially changing three wrappers. Nothing existed at the time like this, but there's a fork of SWIG4 that uh, will generate Fortran. Uh, since you have all that metadata, you can also generate Python wrappers and wrapping Python is a very busy crowd. So uh, the array support, I think, is what sets it apart. And it's available now, it's under BSD clause. Uh, the software.llml.gov has a lot of software that the lab that distributes. It's on GitHub and it's on PyPy because Shroud is written in Python. And questions? I mean, I can't hear. Thanks a lot for the talk. Oh, there we go. Uh, things we're running again a bit short on time. Uh, just a short question about uh, if you could name some packages that actually use Shroud. So uh, this is really the first announcement of it. So it's used inside the laboratory about a, by about a dozen different libraries. So it's not uh, anything you would recognize, but it has seen some real world use and it's been around for about four or five years or four years. Okay, and, and uh, did you try link time optimization to see if the additional overhead by the wrappers can be removed? Uh, I haven't done anything like that. Uh, I mean, I do notice the compiler does some smart stuff because when you're debugging, sometimes you step past some of those layers. So I'd, I like to depend on the uh, sufficiently smart compiler to take care of some of those issues, but I haven't timed it. Okay, I guess we can uh, answer the rest of the questions in the chat. Thanks a lot again.